Hey everybody, thanks for taking a couple minutes out of your day to check out my latest video. Right now I'm going to go over the most common roofing terms. It's supposed to be the 15 most common roofing terms, but I couldn't stop at just 15, so I believe there's actually 16 up there, and we may even come up with some more as we work our way through. So the first one is a square. And if your roofing contractor comes up to you and tells you that your roof is 19 squares, you might look at him and think he's crazy because your roof is not a square. Your roof is a rectangle, multiple rectangles. And if you look over there in the corner, your roof has even got some triangles on it. But that's not what he's talking about. Your roofing contractor is talking about the size of your roof. A square is actually a unit of measurement and it actually refers to 100 square feet. So if your roof is 1,820 square feet versus saying that and having to calculate that and order materials for that, it's much easier to just communicate in squares and say that your roof is 18.2 squares. So that's what that means. A square is a unit of measurement and it is the equivalent of 100 square feet. The next one is decking or sheathing and that's the part of your roof that sits directly on top of your trusses so that would be considered a structural component of your roof it's on top of your trusses but it's underneath the underlayment it's underneath the shingles and it is uh, all the way at the very bottom of the roofing system next one is eave edge that is going to be talked about as essentially your gutter edges. The eave edge is where your gutters sit. And I always remember that if you were to take an E and you were to turn it on its side, it would almost look like a gutter and you could collect water with it. So that's how I remember the difference between eave and rake. And the next one is a rake edge. That is essentially where your roof, your two sections of roof come together and they make an upside down V. That would be your rake edge. Uh, your style D flashing, that's a somewhat regional term. Some people call that a drip edge flashing, but around here it's primarily spoke about as style D flashing. And that's going to go on your rake edge. And that has about a one inch or so lip on it. And that just allows your shingles to extend slightly over the edge of the roof to prevent any driving rain from getting in and causing your roof to leak. The next term is gutter apron, and that's going to go down on your eave edges. The gutter apron is just that. It sits over your gutters. When your gutters come up in a U shape, if this one was to the back of your roof and against your fascia, your gutter apron would come down and overlap that. So any water that's running over the edge of your roof the gutter apron is going to force it to go into the gutter versus if that wasn't there, it could run behind your gutter and cause some leaking and some rot and some damage. The next term is ice and water shield. This one is not only a very common term, but it's a very important term. And your ice and water shield sits down on your eave edges. In our area, the local building codes dictate that it extends two feet inside of your exterior wall. So usually you'll have one and a half, maybe two rows of ice and water shield. And what that stuff does is it's self-adhesive. You peel the backing off of it and it sticks down to a bare uh, roof sheathing or roof decking. It can't adhere to old ice and water shield very well. It can't adhere to underlayment. It has to stick directly to the bare roof deck. And so that's why when we replace a roof, we always strip it down to the bare deck, among other reasons. So that's going to prevent in the winter time when your gutters, not if, but when your gutters fill up with water and that then freezes and turns to ice. And as everybody knows, when water turns to ice, it expands. And so it can actually work its way up underneath your asphalt shingles. But if that ice and water shield is there, and if it's properly installed and it's stuck down to a nice clean bare roof deck, it's going to stick down and it's going to prevent any water from working its way up underneath there and causing you any leaking issues. The next one is synthetic underlayment. 
And that's essentially going to cover all the other area of your roof that is not covered by the ice and water shield. It doesn't generally go in the valleys. It doesn't go um, at your eave edges, but it covers all the rest of the roof area that's not covered by ice and water shield. Some people use the old style uh, asphalt saturated felt. We do not. The synthetic underlayment is a far superior product. And so just with every single roof that we do, we upgrade every single one to the synthetic underlayment because it's just a much better product. It's easier to work with. It's safer to walk on. It doesn't tear as easily. And so we install that on every roof that we do. The next term is your valley. And that is essentially where your two roof sections come together and you create that little trough right there. That's considered your valley. So that's, that's what a valley is called, is where your two roofs come together. The next one is a ridge or ridge vent. And the ridge is basically, if you were to look at your rakes, where the V comes together and makes a point, that's your ridge. And the ridge vent is a venting system that sits on top of that ridge and allows all the hot air from the attic to escape. The next term is a turtle vent. Now this provides the, the same uh, effect as the ridge vent, but it's not quite as effective. We try to upgrade everybody as much as possible to a ridge vent because it ventilates so much better. All of your hot air is going to obviously rise and so it's going to sit right up in that V and it's going to sit as high as possible along that ridge. So if we can get a vent at the very, very top of your roof versus a turtle vent, which is usually down a couple of feet, it's going to ventilate that much better. Now turtle vents are still effective and they're very common. Like I said, we try to upgrade everybody to a ridge vent, but if you have turtle vents, it's nothing to be concerned with. They are industry standard and they will serve their purpose and allow that hot air to escape. They're just not quite as effective as a ridge vent, but they're actually called a turtle vent and that's kind of what I call them. Some people call them a box vent because it, it looks like there's a little square box sitting on your roof. I kind of think of it as it looks like there's a little turtle sitting on your roof or actually a big turtle because they're about you know 12 inches in diameter or 12 inches square. So that would be considered a turtle vent or a box vent. The next term is impact rated, or for short, we just call it IR. There's actually only two impact ratings. There's class three impact rating and there's class four impact rating. Your average shingle, just to start out with, kind of your economy shingle, is not going to be impact rated at all. And the impact rating is just that. It's rated based on the impact that it can take, which primarily is hail. You really don't get a lot of other impacts on your roof other than hail, you know, other than maybe the stray tree branch falling or things of that nature. So there's class three and there's class four impact rating. We install Malarkey shingles, Malarkey brand, kind of a funny name, but it's a serious shingle. We've installed it for quite a number of years now, about 10 years, and we've never had an issue, never had a warranty claim or anything like that. So, so like I said, we installed the Malarkey shingles and they come with a, a basic shingle that's not impact rated, but they also come with a class three impact rated shingle. And then they come with a class four impact rated shingle which is the Malarkey Legacy, which is what we try to upgrade our clients to as much as possible. It does add some additional cost, but you can get some uh, discounts on your insurance premium. So you usually make that money back over a number of years. The next term is cut up. And that's probably not a term that you'll really hear talked about too much. Us roofing contractors talk about it a lot. Uh, the salesman might talk about it because that's essentially how many sections your roof is cut into. And that, that's literally what it means. It's cut up. If your roof, if this was just flat and it was one straight section across there, your roof would not be cut up very much. But on this roof in particular, you'd have one section here, two sections here, three sections, four sections, five, six, 
And so just on this one side, you'd have six separate sections of roofing. And if you then doubled that on the other side, you'd have 12 different sections of roof. And so that's what it means when, when you talk about whether or not your roof is cut up. This one would absolutely be considered very cut up. The next term is walkable. And that's a pretty basic term. It, it kind of describes itself. And that's just if you can walk on your roof in good weather in the summertime when it's dry and the shingles are warm, unaided, you don't have to have any ropes, you don't have to have any roof jacks or anything like that. If you can fairly easily walk on it and perform work on it, it would be considered walkable. And those two things uh, greatly affect the labor price of your roof, uh, how much that's going to cost. Because if it's very cut up, we've got a lot of different areas to deal with. We've got flashings here. We've got valleys here and here and here. We've got a skylight. We've got more flashing here. Um, if it's walkable or not, if it's very steep and we have to install roof jacks on here to stand on, or if we have to put some anchors up on your ridge so that we can run ropes down to then literally hang off of the ropes to install that roofing material, that's not walkable and that's going to add greatly to the labor cost. The next one is kind of a generalized term uh, as far as roof penetrations or just penetrations. And that's going to be anything that goes through your roof. Anything that penetrates through that roof sheathing is going to be considered a roof penetration. So that could be chimneys, that could be sewer pipes, uh, that could be turtle vents, that could be skylights. Anything like that is considered a roof penetration. And that's also going to add to the labor cost of replacing your roof because we've got to take extra time to work around those penetrations. You know, a, a pipe is going to get a special boot, uh, a chimney and a wall over here are going to get additional flashings. A skylight is going to get additional flashing. So all that stuff factors into the cost of replacing your roof. And the final term here, I believe it's number 16, is the starter shingles. And I don't actually have it listed on here. But your starter shingles are going to go along your eave edge. Each and every course or row of shingles is going to adhere with a little bit of tar to the row below it. So this, this course is going to adhere to the course below it and vice versa all the way down to the bottom of your roof. When you get to the bottom of your roof, which is where you start, there's nothing for that first shingle to adhere to. So that's why we install starter shingles along your eave edges so that that first shingle course has something to stick to to prevent it from blowing off if you get some wind. So this is a few of the most common roofing terms. There's probably, I, I easily could have come up with 20 to 25, but I tried to narrow it down a little bit for time's sake. But this is going to help you to be educated when you're talking to a potential contractor and you're kind of interviewing them, you could say, to see if you want them to replace your roof for you. If you start throwing out terms like this and you know what these terms mean, you're going to show that roofing contractor that you mean business and you're educated and you're not going to be taken advantage of. So we absolutely love when our clients and our homeowners are educated. We always, always come from the standpoint of education. And I'm the primary salesman and I always approach our potential clients from a standpoint of education <coughs> because to be frank with you, I suck at sales. So I couldn't sell you anything if I wanted to. But what I can do is I can educate you and help you to make the proper decision. So if you're going to be talking to a, a roofing contractor or a roofing salesman and you're going to be saying, hey, my roof is pretty cut up, but it's still walkable. You know, it has a few penetrations, but it's not too bad. And then when you get through the process and you're going through their estimate, and you ask them, are those shingles impact rated? How are you going to deal with all the penetrations that are going through my roof? Do you reflash the skylights? Do you replace the pipe boots? Do you reflash the chimneys? Things like that. Um, 
I have turtle vents now. Will you upgrade me for free to a ridge vent and plug off all of the turtle vents and replace those? Do you use synthetic underlayment or do you use the older style asphalt saturated underlayment? Are you going to replace my gutter apron? Are you going to replace my style D flashing? Are you going to strip my roof down to the bare deck? Or are you just going to pull off the shingles and go over the existing underlayment? How many squares is my roof? What did you come up with for a measurement? All these things are terms that you can use to essentially interview a roofing contractor that wants to work on your home. And if they can't rattle off the answers to, at the very minimum, the terms that I talked to you about today, you probably don't want to be dealing with them because these are extremely elementary terms when it comes to roofing. So I will leave this up here for just a minute and I'll, I'll step out of the frame and zoom the camera in here so you can screenshot this if you'd like or you can write down these terms or feel free to use this diagram as much as you would like. Thank you for watching.